Hi, my name is Finale Doshi Velas, and I'm very excited to be able to join you virtually for this Applied Machine Learning Day. Today, I'm going to be talking about validation in RL for health and the value of including the experts. So how can RL or reinforcement learning help in healthcare? I'm going to start out with one story um, describing some of the work that we have done in our lab. In this example, we were trying to optimize HIV treatments. And the goal here is to manage the patient's HIV right now, but also avoid resistance in future, ensuring that the patients uh, can also be managed in future as well. Um, and one way we like to think about this, or one way to model this, is that the patient has a bunch of things going on that's evolving over time. Meds are being given, and that affects the evolution, but we don't see everything that's going on in the patient. We just see some measurements that are coming out, CD4 counts, viral loads, et cetera, right? Um, so the first question when we're given this data, because we only observe the data down here and the treatments up here, is how do we create a model? And for this particular example, we had an interesting insight. And that insight was that perhaps it's not useful to pick exactly one model. Maybe there are multiple alternatives that work better for different types of patients. And conceptually, the core insight was that many patients lie in clusters. They're lucky enough to have patients that are very similar to them. And if you're in this boat, if you have patients that are very similar to you, then perhaps they're best modeled by their neighbors, right? So if you have a twin, look at what happened to all of your twins. Um, for different treatment options and see which one works best. On the other hand, if you're unlucky, you might be a patient that doesn't have any neighbors nearby. And if you are such a patient, then rather than uh, finding neighbors that are further away that may not really look like you, it may be better to fall back on a parametric model of disease progression, right? Something like the picture that I drew on the previous slide. So this was a core modeling insight. And then we went ahead and we optimized this combination policy that said, should you select actions based on your neighbors or should you select actions based on the parametric model? And the selection was done on the basis of the patient statistics, but also the cohort, right? Because we want to know whether you have nearby neighbors or not. And based on this function, we outputted some actual action, the action that we recommended. Once we had trained this uh, combination policy, we evaluated it statistically on the data set. So the particular data set that we were using was a data set of about 33,000 patients from the EU RESIST database and held out about 3,000 for testing. And in this particular data set, I want to also point out the large action size. Um, so there's 312 drug combinations that we treated as 312 different types of actions. And what we see here is that if you only rely on your neighbors, you do pretty well. Um, if you rely only on a parametric model, actually it's really hard to model the disease, so you don't do as well. Um, but if you use mixtures of various kinds, right, going between these neighbors and these models, um, you can actually do significantly better than either using neighbors alone or models alone. And this was like a really cool uh, discovery, right, that um, instead of sticking to one model, here is this very simple way of combining two different models that can give you some really nice statistical results. And this idea, you know, we uh, developed it in the context of this particular project, but we've applied it to multiple places. Uh, for example, over the summer, we did some work where we transferred from the same EU cohort um, to a cohort in South Africa. And the cohort in South Africa is being measured um, much less often and contains different types, different strains of HIV. So there isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one easy transfer between patients in the EU and patients in South Africa. Um, but what we found is that if we're careful and clever about the transfer, so now what we're looking for in terms of twins, we're trying to find twins of South Africans in the EU cohort. And if you're lucky enough to have a twin in the EU cohort, then we really understand how to treat those patients well because those patients are measured very often and thus very well managed. Um, whereas if you're not lucky enough to have an actual twin, you know, your HIV is of a different type, we don't wanna map you into an incorrect match. And therefore we fall back to the local data, which is less well curated. And by combining the local data and the transfer, again, we're getting, 
significantly better statistical results. So DR stands for doubly robust, IS is for important sampling, WIS is for weighted important sampling. These are all statistical estimators that can be used to estimate the quality of a new policy, a proposed policy, given data that has already been collected. Another extension that we have used of this idea of combining two different types of models um, is in the context of hypotension management in the ICU. So in this case, we were looking at a cohort of about 15,000 patients. And uh, we used two different ways of summarizing the patient histories, one only looking at recent information and one looking at, at a way to compress the entire past history until the time now. And then again, we see that MOE stands for mixtures of experts. So we combine a kernel, which you can think of as a neighbor-based policy, um, with a DQN, deep Q network, which you can think of as a parametric model. If you combine these two together, you can get results that are better than either alone and significantly better than the behavior policy or what we see in the data set itself in terms of the clinician actions that are being taken. Um, so this was really exciting, right? We have these statistical ways of doing validation and these statistical ways are suggesting that the policies that we're finding um, might actually be quite useful. And to continue to follow up on that, uh, we did some basic sanity check type plots where we looked at the difference between our recommendation and what the doctors did. So the bottom axis is the difference between our, what we recommended, what the doctors did, and mortality rates. And you see it, um, in both cases, in this case, hypotension management, we were looking at two types of actions, giving fluids and giving vasopressors. And you see this kind of U-shaped curve. And the U-shaped curve indicates that um, uh, when there's a deviation from what we recommend, we end up in a situation where the mortality rates are in general higher, right? So this also kind of is, seems like it's supporting evidence, right? That um, when the doctors are doing what we say, the mortality rates are lower, which suggests that perhaps our recommendations are good. I emphasize that perhaps because in this particular case, uh, we had some awesome students who decided to plot some other policies that we'd never think of plotting before, right? We're never think of plotting. We said random actions, that's clearly not a good idea, and doing nothing, which is also not a good idea. And importantly, we see the same U-shaped curves um, for both of these cases, right? Um, and so this isn't saying that our policies are somehow bad necessarily, but it's saying that these statistics have limits, right? These statistics, that these plots that I'm showing you um, can't really be used to convince you that this policy is a good idea. And there's lots of these limitations. All statistics will have limits. So this doubly robust estimator, this important sampling estimator, they all have some pretty severe limitations um, that are fundamental because of just uh, you know, how the data are collected. So all statistics, not just this particular statistics are gonna have limits. And so for the rest of this talk, what I really wanna focus on is this emphasis on we really need to think about how we combine AIs or statistical methods with humans from the start. And to do so, I'm gonna first lay out this overall picture of how I think about validation, especially in the RL space, but this is pretty broad as well. Um, so there's a class of approaches, which I think of as the statistically focused approaches. Uh, very basic things one can do and that we do actually do, I didn't show you all of our homework, is that we check for sensitivity, we check for robustness, you know, are these policies, policies um, that you'll find again if you take a bootstrap of the data set, if you leave out certain variables, if you clean variables in a certain way, right, these are all really important things to think about. Um, and also off policy evaluation. So those were the doubly robust, important sampling, et cetera, estimators, right? So there's a lot of statistically focused stuff. And that stuff is valuable because if the statistically focused um, estimators are telling you that your policy is crap, you probably don't want to take the time of an expert to get their feedback um, because the statistics are already telling you that, hey, this is a bad idea, right? But when the statistics you know, come out, come out fine, right? Then the next obvious question is, well, um, you know, is it good? Like, can it be deployed? And the answer is probably no, right? The, the answer is that we need to do some additional validation um, to check for all the other ways in which, you know, having limited data, an incomplete picture 
of the patient's disease, et cetera, might have thrown off some of the machine learning modeling. So today I'm gonna to focus on this half, the human focused half of how we can design models and really think carefully about how human experts can help us do validation in these reinforcement learning settings. All right, so I'm gonna start out by talking about local validation. So this is a validation of specific decisions, right? So we present some information about a case we present a recommendation, and we're gonna ask the clinician to say whether or not this is a good idea. And we have in fact done this, like for the HIV work that I mentioned earlier, we both check against the standard of care and by asking a panel of experts. And what I think is useful here is that most experts mostly agreed with our recommendations, which is good. Um, and where they disagreed, like the two places, the four places, the four places, they weren't the same. So we feel like we're kind of in the range of like solutions where reasonable people might disagree. There wasn't situations where we're suggesting anything that was completely loony. So that's great. But there is an obvious question. How do you know if you've checked enough examples? Maybe what we can do instead, you know, is ask clinicians as they go, right? So um, we present them with an example, and before they do anything, before they make a recommendation, um, we hope that they are checking the recommendation of the AI for a, a sanity check, make sure that, that whatever they're recommending is reasonable, right? Um, so can we do that? So we did a study about how explanations might help experts vet recommendations at the point of care, right? So we had a cohort of over 2,000, uh, sorry, 200, not 2,000, 200 psychiatrists. And we asked them to provide recommendations for patients with major depression. And a sample case might look like the following over here. So we, we did some work to create summaries. So this is all Wizard of Oz, right? Because we wanted to see how um, explanations might help. So there weren't a real AI. I just emphasize that from the beginning. Um, but we made up these patients. Uh, descriptions. And the base case was just, you know, here's a patient description. What drug would you recommend for this patient? What's the right therapy recommendation in this case to deal again with major depression? And then on top of this base case, we studied a couple of variations. One variation was the case and a recommendation. So the recommendation in this case is duloxetine. And there's some predictions that come out of the system. It says how likely are patients to stay on this drug if you start them on this drug? Um, how likely are patients to drop out of, the, of psychiatric care completely if you give them this drug? Like, they're so frustrated that they leave. Um, so we give these numbers um, and we give the, the top drug as the recommendation. And again, I'm emphasizing that this is a local situation because there's a specific patient specific recommendation that the um, clinicians are being asked to take into account when they make their recommendation. Again, the question is what drug to give, right? Not whether this is right or not, what drug to give. Um, and that's important because we wanted to simulate what happens actually in the process of care rather than the process of you know, careful model checking. So the idea here is that, well, if we can't check every single case, hopefully um, people will notice if something's funny, right? While they're doing it, just ignore it. We also provided some uh, recommendations with explanations. So in this case, we have the case, we have the recommendation, we have the why or the explanation in the form of features. Um, so here, um, here are the top features um, that result in this particular recommendation. Another form of explanation that we considered was again, case recommendation, and then an explanation that's in terms of rules. So for this patient, the most relevant rules were that if you're, for example, concerned about QT prolongation, then favor sertraline and avoid citalopram, right? And you notice over here actually that this rule is not being followed um, for this particular recommendation, or at least in part. And then finally, just as a placebo, we included an explanation of the form, you know, the predictions are based on the, the patient's codes or the patient's data. And this was just to make sure that we controlled for the fact that if the explanation, uh, if, the, if the, what the person sees is a bit bigger, a bit longer, um, seems to have some justification, 
how does that affect how people behave? So this is what we find. So the first thing, first important thing that we find is that if we give no um, explanation or no recommendation rather, um, here's our base level of accuracy. When our recommendations are correct, the system is correct, the accuracy goes up, hooray. Um, but when the system recommendations are incorrect, the accuracy goes down. So this means that locally in the moment, um, clinicians aren't able to um, or aren't for whatever reason, are not picking up on the fact that you know there was an incorrect recommendation. They're going with the bad recommendation, thus decreasing in accuracy. Um, there's some decrease in confidence and notice in helpfulness as well, um, but this does not, you know, whatever kind of misgivings or confusion people have had, it still affects the accuracy. The accuracy goes down. And what we found um, that was particularly interesting is that let's here's here's accuracy at baseline, and now we've split it up by the different explanation types for the situation where the recommendation is incorrect. And what we find is that the quality um, uh, with the expert rules goes down some, but goes down a lot more um, with the feature base. Um, and the feature base one we remember was like because of diabetes or something like this, versus this one was the example with the if they have QT prolongation, then favor this drug, rather not do this drug, right? It was much longer. And people didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that it was longer. So if you look at perceived helpfulness, right? This is now self-reported. They believe that the feature-based explanations were more helpful, but they actually made more mistakes when given those explanations. Um, and I think that this is really interesting and useful for us to know um, as we are building our systems, our machine learning systems, in terms of uh, there's a lot of interest, including my own interest in terms of making systems very explainable or private, providing information so that a person given the information can make the correct decision, synthesize things together. And what we're seeing is that that correct information is, is maybe not the, the most obvious, right? The, in this case, slowing people down, forcing people to think through the expert rules um, seem to help them avoid making bad decisions uh, that was also more frustrating, right? Um, and so maybe this also suggests that like expecting people to do checks at the bedside is not ideal. So another study that I'm not presenting here, um, we shared this sort of system with a group of primary care docs. And this time, instead of a quiz, it was an interview format. And one thing they expressed is, well, if the system is wrong, why, like, why are you giving us potentially wrong explanations while we're seeing a patient, right? This is a, this is a wrong time for us to be vetting a system. So that push up, pushes us over to say that, okay, maybe we want to check a particular decision, um, but especially in the health setting, checking a specific decision for a specific case from an AI um, is a kind of tricky idea, right? Like uh, many times if the person is in the process of seeing their patient, they don't necessarily wanna do this. And if they're in the mode of just trying to provide a, a good recommendation for their patient, they might, if their AI system is available, they're, they're more likely to over rely on it than actually make a good decision based off of it, right? So maybe we need to do a bit of homework first, which is perhaps obvious, right? Um, before putting a system out there, we shouldn't put the onus of the people at, uh, of the correctness and the validation at the people on the front lines. Um, we really should do our checking first as much as possible, just like we did our statistically focused work um, before moving on to our human focused work, probably makes sense to check on the, the overall, you know, model first before asking people to take responsibility for specific decisions. All right, so that gives us then the task of explaining the model overall. And what's the way to do this? So there's two major categories, at least in my mind, that one might go about doing this. The first one is by example. So you have a system, it's making recommendations, and I give you a couple of examples of what the recommendations are. And based on that, I hope that you get a sense of how the system is gonna behave. And you get it, you tell me like, hey, the system seems a bit wonky. I think it's going to screw up in certain cases. Or you're like, oh, okay, I get the sense of how the system behaves. I think it's a great idea, right? 
So to test this um, overall, sort of like how would you even present, you know, you have to choose a few examples, right? You can't present the entire system. Maybe it's too complicated. Um, how would you go about doing that? We did the following study. So we did a study where um, a, a human user um, had access to only some of the uh, recommendations or actions of a system, right? So here are some. And what we, uh, what we asked then the user to do is for some other select squares um, to figure out, to make a guess of what the action should be or what they believe that the action rather of the agent will be in those particular scenarios. So if you're looking at this, you're probably thinking go out toward the blue regions or something like that. Then we did the exact same test, um, but this time, um, instead of being a grid world like this, we had something that looked like um, coming out of an HIV simulator. So these were the, the statistics, so the biomarkers, CD4s, viral loads, et cetera, um, evolving over time. So you see these trajectories and we ask what happens if the patient is in this particular state, right? What recommendation will the system give? And if you're looking at this kind of confused and then trying to map onto like, oh, okay, I think it looks like this one maybe over here, that's exactly the sort of thing that most people did. And what we found um, is that depending on the scenario, whether it was a grid world or the HIV case, um, people in their subjective descriptions um, seem to be using different methods. So IL stands for imitation learning. So just copying, like trying to find a match, right? Like the, this guy seems to be like this one over here, right? That's the process of finding a match. Um, and IRL is inverse reinforcement learning. So believing there's a goal, like go to the blue squares. Um, so humans use different methods in different scenarios, right? That was one thing we found. And the other thing we found is that it doesn't quite, it's important to account for and it doesn't quite correspond to what, or actually very much doesn't correspond to like the perfect IL. So if the humans were the perfect IL, this would have been their um, a prediction accuracy. If humans had been the perfect IRL, um, they would have reached this level of accuracy. You can see the human performance is quite uh, below that. It's better than random, but it's, it's quite below um, these thresholds. And what that suggests to us is that Unless we really know how people extrapolate, and this, these studies suggest that that's hard, um, presenting examples as a way of getting humans to do validation might be risky. And here we were trying to be clever, right? We presented examples such that the perfect IL learner would be able to learn the system. We presented examples such that the perfect IRL or inverse reinforcement learner would be able to learn the system. But humans are neither perfect imitation learners nor perfect inverse reinforcement learners. And so even if we did this clever step of trying to provide the most informative examples of trajectories, um, humans still extrapolated in ways that we did not expect. All right, so that leads me to the last part of the talk um, where I really wanna go into a little more detail, which is, well, if we can't summarize by example and we need humans to do the validation, then we got to make the model simple, right? In one way or another, people are going to need to be able to look at these models. And that has been a big effort in my lab where we have been trying to create not these ginormous expressive models anymore, but small models that do a good job and are small enough for people to actually take a look at. And the core idea here is that we want a generative model, right? We believe that the diseases create the data so a mixture model um, is, is one of these, a topic model, whether uh, you know, partially observable Markov decision process, that was the HIV model. In all of these cases, um, we hope that the, whatever structure we find, whether it's clusters, topics, um, states, that these are useful for something, that the patient state predicts disease progression, for example, patient topics predict the outcome, et cetera, right? So we want a generative model because we believe the diseases produce the data, um, but we want that generative model to also be good at making predictions. So let's formalize this notion, right? So I'm gonna go into, well, most of this talk is fairly high level, but I'm gonna get a little bit more specific for this part. Um, here's the idea. The, there are some patient conditions um, and these patient conditions produce some data um, in, in consort with some parameters that are out there. 
Now, in reality, um, what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of patient data. Um, so in our psychiatry applications, we have thousands of dimensions here. Um, in our critical care um, and HIV applications, we have tens of dimensions here, um, tens to hundreds. So these are, these are pretty big. And, and if the outcome is relatively small, like treatment worked or um, you know, the viral load or something like this, then there's a tension um, where you know, this model believes that these things are symmetric. So you know, why is a mistake here any worse than making a mistake and say this one over here, right? And so what, one thing that people have done is that they've just replicated the number of dimensions of the outcome. So just make a copy, right? Um, if one is too few, then make it like a thousand. Now these are both a thousand. Um, and I'm not gonna go into it in detail here, but you can see our papers. Um, but we've shown that this idea of label replication, A, does not work. Um, and B, that many previous approaches to solving this problem have been things that reduce the label replication, right? So many previous approaches to kind of fix this actually don't fix the problem. So our solution has been what we call this task constrained objective. So we wanna explain the data the best we can, right? We want a good generative model, explain the X's, um, subject to the constraint that the predictions from X to Y um, are of sufficient quality, right? Um, so the predictions have to be good from X to Y, that's our, our goal. Um, and then um, as long as the predictions are good enough, make the generative model as good as you can. Okay, so very intuitive, but it is different, fundamentally different than label replication. And I can show you here with just a couple of equations. So label replication um, in, enhances the link between the hidden condition and the outcome Y. So remember theta is the condition and the outcome is Y. Um, whereas the prediction constrained objective that I showed on the previous slide, um, uh, emphasizes or, or plays up this process of going from X to Y, right? It, the, this lambda is sitting outside this integral over possible patient conditions. So it's looking at X to Y, whereas label replication is only looking from the hidden to the Y and not from the X to the Y, right? Because the R is up here. So we took this idea and we applied it back to that hypotension management problem. And um, here we, we had a somewhat simplified setting, nine vitals, um, about 10K uh, stays. And um, again, the goal was to keep blood pressure in range. And uh, what we wanted was a good generative model. So log likelihood of the data with respect to the model um, with the constraint that the off policy value estimate of the optimal policy with respect to the model was of sufficient quality. And that's modulated by this lambda here. And now the actual process of doing this optimization is actually quite tricky um, because you have to optimize through the off policy estimator, through the policy optimization from M to pi star, um, all the way back to the parameters of the model. Again, keeping this fairly high level, I'm not gonna go into that, but just um, you can check out our paper if you want all of those details, lots of gory details there. Um, but what we find, is that um, with only five discrete states, remember the previous example um, uh, with, the, with the RNNs, that one actually had 128 continuous um, states. We're able to get um, situations where we can explain the data fairly well. So this is data only explanation um, and get pretty good policies. So this is a model that only tries to get good policies. Um, and here we're able to get a mo model that explains the data well, so that can be inspected by clinicians. It kind of makes sense to clinicians. Um, as well as um, seems to have a good off policy estimate. And remember, we wanted good off policy estimates because we want, you know, if the, if the off policy estimate is bad, um, then we question, you know, why are we wasting anyone's time even looking at this policy? And so we're finding cases where these values are high, um, but also because they explain the data well, we believe that there is a good chance that a clinician could look at this, inspect it, and tell us where it truly makes sense or not. And here's just a quick picture of the sorts of plots we can get um, uh, to be able to make these comparisons. I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but uh, these are things that would make sense to a clinician when we look at it, when we say like, you know, does it make sense for the outputs under this action in the state to look kind of like this? 
So that was from uh, distributions over uh, what, 128 variables to distributions over five states, a five state POMDP. Um, I'm really excited about this work because we get it down even smaller. And the key insight that now we are taking advantage of is that in the, in the health setting, in the batch reinforcement learning setting, we can really only make recommendations in settings where clinicians disagree. So if we have these trajectories where the different colors represent different states, just as cartoons, um, if we have situations where um, actions uh, like in red state, sometimes it's action one, sometimes it's action two. Well, in those situations, um, you know, maybe we as a uh, machine learning people, we can recommend which of these was the better choice. In this light blue state, only action one is ever taken. So there's no information for us to create a better recommendation. Um, so we have two states, to optimize, and so we build this tiny two-state MDP because the only places where clinicians agree are in the red and yellow, right? So we can collapse everything else and basically create a tiny model with just those two cases, right? So that's a cartoon. We did this actually, and what we find is that they, there's 14 clusters in this particular data set. Um, and the beauty of this is that we, we, we um, reduce the number of actions down to doing nothing, giving fluids, giving vasopressors, giving flu fluids and vasopressors. And the beauty of this is I can show you on a one slide four different policies, right? Um, which says that in this state, um, you know, we recommend giving fluids if we have a policy that um, emphasizes the importance of the terminal rewards or survival at the end of stay. Um, we have this piecewise policy, which focuses on the actual blood pressure measurement gives us something different. Mm, okay, I don't know, that that makes us maybe feel a little nervous. Um, and see, this is another third reward function. So we can look now in terms of sensitivity, we can see situations where different choices of reward produce different policies and how it compares to clinician behavior over here, right? And this is just so exciting because on one slide, again, I'm showing you three different options um, for people to be able to think about. And we pair that, with um, figures like this that say for each of these decision regions, these 14 clusters, um, what was the you know, average map value, the average lactate, et cetera. So with these two pictures, people are able to take a close look and validate whether these recommendations make sense or whether something happened in terms of like a confounder that was um, not modeled properly in the data. All right, so I have given you like a whirlwind tour of a lot of different ways that we've been thinking about human focused validation or how experts can help us, uh, you know, in terms of validating models that come out of RL. Um, the very last example I wanna give is how we put these things together. Um, you know, can experts actually help with off policy or evaluation or statistical techniques? I mean, in this case, um, we wanna estimate the value of a proposed treatment policy and the idea here is that we wanna expose sensitive points for humans to validate. So let's suppose we're sitting here um, at some start state. We have some trajectories like this, some trajectories like this, some trajectories that come down. And we want to evaluate the quality of this particular trajectory over here. Well, in this case, it's great, right? We have tons of data um, you know, that took this particular path and we can estimate the quality of this path. Well, if we looked into a situation like this, you know, humans can't help, right? We can just tell you that, hey, we can't evaluate this like kind of a zigzag policy because there's no zigzag in the data, right? There's no way for us to know whether you can, you can do this, the, the, the zig and the zigzag. But what about if we had a situation that looked like this, where you know, we have plenty of data here, plenty of data here, but only one example of, be, of hopping from the top to the bottom. Can we build an estimator out of that? Well, from a statistical perspective, you know, the answer is it's super sensitive to that particular point, we're kind of screwed. But um, maybe a human can look at this, right? Um, maybe a human can look at this and tell us whether it makes sense. And if it makes sense, if we believe that it's representative, then we can trust our estimate. So the process of exposing these sensitive points, I've just shown you the cartoon, um, involves a bit of math. We get basically efficient ways of finding these sensitive points. I mean, it helps us in, in back to the hypotension management problem in useful ways, because over here, um, we have an, a, an example of a, a trajectory where like no action is being taken until this time over here. 
Um, and yet the patient looks like they have a really low di dip in terms of their blood pressure, right? So it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. The action is taken here, it's not taken at this dip. Um, so this shows up as a very sensitive point when you're doing the validation. Um, and, and notice that we don't have time, like the clinicians don't have time to validate every single statistic and every single trajectory, right? There was like 10K trajectories, 15K trajectories in this data set. Um, with tens of variables. Um, but what we have done is we've highlighted it, hey, this particular one is affecting our estimate of the policy. Do you believe it? Um, in this case, um, our clinicians looked at it. They said, oh, this has to be a bad reading. Um, you know, it must be probably down here. You know, it was, it was gradually declining, 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 and this is where the action was taken. That's that's the, you know, the sensible story for this. Um, it absolutely does not make sense that the, the blood pressure would have dipped this low. Um, and no action would have been taken or, or action is taken significantly later. So here's an example, you know, where humans again are helping with the validation because we couldn't have caught this, right? The fact we couldn't have known that there was a bad reading here. Like bad readings happen in weird ways. Um, sometimes you can build models for them, but sometimes you can't. Um, and again, this is emphasizing the need for human and AI or statistical collaboration when it comes to validation. So here's the last part then of the, the roadmap. Um, you know, we have statistically focused methods. We have human focused methods um, that I've summarized here today. Um, and we also, I, I think a really exciting area is how do we put these together, right? Um, how do we take the validation that humans can do and the validation that we can do computationally and get something that's even stronger? So um, in conclusion, um, you know, for RL to make an impact in healthcare, as well as other areas, it's really important to think holistically about validation and think holistically about validation from the start. Like our need for validation you know, has driven this entire research program around making these very small models, these very small inspectable models. It turns out we can make models pretty small um, and still have very good um, quality policies that come out. Right. So depending on the domain, you know, sometimes the policies don't need to be so complicated. The models don't need to be so expressive. But as soon as you make them smaller, they're going to be harder and harder to actually optimize and solve for. But that's exciting, right? That's exciting for us as machine learning people to try to figure out how best to do that. Um, so uh, the last thing I'd like to do in conclusion um, is to thank um, a lot of my uh, all of my collaborators. Um, this is work um, not only with my lab, but people um, in the clinical space, um, people in the HCI space, people in the, the cognitive science space. Um, there's a, a confluence of you know, human experts, clinical experts, machine learning experts to make this all happen. And I'm very glad um, to be able to work with such a wonderful team.